So our second reader tonight is someone whose work is part of and contributes to the charting of a new path, the lighting of a literary torch, the making of a way towards sustainability and preservation of a community's history. Zhe Zhang is a student of creative nonfiction, a weaver of prose, but more than that, she is a leader and a visionary who recognizes the contributions she can make and the significance of the role she can play to support and expand the possibilities for a flourishing Hmong literary present and future. Her writing is both a grasping at the past and yet a reaching toward the new. Jur's work attempts to reckon with the intersectional self, the multiple selves the self that has to intuitively code switch in order to place itself in this world as part of this world. It is the self that continually seeks and carves out its own spaces of, of belonging in a landscape where spaces are few and far between. It is the self that knows it deserves a seat at the table alongside everyone else. This is important work the kind of work needed to start building toward a literary legacy that may not be fully realized until generations from today. That's why the work must happen now and Jur fully gets that, as evidenced in particular by her leadership and initiative to co-found with other students, the Hmong American Inc. and Stories Organization to support Hmong writers and other students who have felt alone in their writing and without a place of their own. But underscoring these realizations is the embracing and reconciling of one's status as a literary orphan, as a Hmong writer descended from a people without a definitive history of writing, but who in lieu of that have developed instead a thriving oral tradition. To have been without for so long as a result of upheaval, war, migration, exile, and yet to still acknowledge the beauty, grace, and resilience of that history what it says of a people. Jur's culminating body of work, How to Call a Name, Essays on Interloping and Returning, is a stunning series of essays that centers the complexities of the Hmong identity and experience through her own lens as a daughter of refugees and as a Hmong woman standing in her power. These are not essays that speak of exotic flowers or long lost folk tales. They do not offer romanticized portrayals of an oral culture, nor do they attempt to service or make themselves more palatable for the Western gaze. Instead, these essays have teeth. These essays are ready to bite back. These essays are done waiting. In their unveiling of angst, honesty, tumultuousness, and even tears, in their questionings of language, belief systems, and literacy, in their complicated and yet earnest renderings, these essays speak their own truth. In the piece titled Calling, about a brother grappling with the weight of his Hmong identity, Jur writes, hold him and say, my dear brother, come back. He will pull against you, how typical, perhaps he is not lost yet, and he will cry endlessly, this is the curse we hold, a heavy heart seeking our place in this world. Recall the photo shoot of him as a seven month old baby. Remember how you placed your index finger into his tiny curled fist, whispered to his sleeping baby face that you were his older sister. Call him, call his name and tell him to return. Jur is a writer who understands the potential of her work to heal herself and others, to speak what is hard to say but must be said. Here is a writer willing to do battle with her shadow in order to reclaim what is rightfully hers. And as a student leader, she has much to celebrate and look back on from her editorial contributions to the Watershed Review, which is the literary journal of her undergraduate program back at Chico State, the Normal School, the Philip Levine Prize for Poetry, along with Hai and the Hmong American Writer Circle, among a host of other activities and accomplishments. Just kind of gathering myself, but this I 
this was really very uh, intense for me to be able to do and to support both of my students tonight. So let me just finish that <laughs> and catch my breath. And with that, please help me welcome Jur Shang. Um, thank you, Mike, for the introduction. Um, that really means so much to me. You have no idea. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I did write down my thanks, so I'm just going to read off of it. Um, <laughs> Okay, my dear got me going, so oh, sorry. Let me collect myself. Sorry. I didn't think this would happen, so sorry. Um, um this writing journey is not taken alone. Uh, so many people have helped have helped me to be here today. Thank you to the professors, my Dur, Bryn, Stephen, John, Connie. Shout out to the professors from Chico State, Sarah, Jeannie, Rob, and in general, all my folks from Chico. Thank you for coming. Thank you to all the friends, mentors, and peers. So many of you that I won't be able to name you all, but thank you for your voices, the conversations, the community. New, yeah, Gal, Tony, Lee, Mai, Ali, Anthony, Manny, Javi, Angel, Erica, Esme, Mariah, and so many others. Shout out to the Hmong Americans writer circles and to the ones I didn't mention earlier, Kathy, Andre, Burley, Ying, who I met at AW 2017, AWP 2017. And also shout outs to the members of my organization, Hmong American Ink and Stories. Thank you to David for your endless patience. Thank you, um, last but not least, to Jefferson and Sydney for taking care of this event. Um, just to say some brief things about my thesis, which uh, is taken from my abstract, um, like my Dur mentioned, um, being a Hmong American writer was very lonely. Um, Andre once aptly described this feeling that you know we felt like orphans. And in our culture, orphans were low caste with no ancestry and no family support. They were ostracized and left to fend for themselves. And as writers, we were like, without heritage and without representation. We had few students interested in English and even, even fewer four figures of Hmong American literature. It was difficult to be, begin, but it must start somewhere. And, and this is how these writings came to existence. As I continuously think about what it means to write Hmong American literature, what it means to write to, for, and about my community, but also to diversify narratives within our community in the larger literature. <clears throat> So I'm going to read two pieces tonight. One piece is a short piece and the one will be a little bit longer. So this first piece I'm going to read is a short piece dedicated to Paul Moore, who was very important, who was a very important writer to us. Um, he passed away last year in April. The title of this piece is Blooming Lineage, which takes the word bloom from his book title and poem, Karst Mountains Will Bloom. Blooming lineage. I can believe that nothing has changed if I do not move. Let my partner spiral into the kitchen and turn the stove knob. Listen to the pan sizzle as the eggs drop inside, sliding from the tilted coil, crinkling in its orbit. The dog lies by his feet, awaiting with ears pulled down, a docile plea. Sunlight sparkles off the line of parked cars into the living room. The sky is blue and clear as peak spring demands. 
the nearby highway hushes in its course without hindrance. I close my eyes and memorialize this pretty morning in your wake. There are many posts recalling and piecing you in the internet space, a collage of father, husband, teacher, mentor, poet, dear friend, but I can't say your name yet. I'm not ready to declare this new day. We gather at a downtown gallery in your city of Merced and I am nervous. I do not know you nor most of the other readers. Your friends put the event together to celebrate your life and the next generation of writers like me. They tell me of your cancer diagnosis. I carry only two poems, one finish and a draft that I rewrite over and over until the last minute when I am called to the podium. It's titled Fate Papers and I cry through the lines, in another lifetime, we play together as brothers and sisters. In this lifetime, I travel to find you, a nomad searching for a family with the same force in their tongues. It is sentimental and wholly inadequate in English, but in home, I believe they reach you. After the reading, we meet and you are delighted. You are so proud of me already, and I have never been more grateful to drive three hours to be found here with you and our friends. After all these lone years, I am finally home. I try to compose beautiful lines for you, but nothing comes out except furious scribbles. How dare the sunlight spotlight your absence, the nerve of light to keep, how awful time stomps on. I want to rip it all apart. How dare it, how dare, how dare this fate, this devastation. All of it is ugly because I'm wrecked. I wept for weeks and still can't write a for worthy farewell. We are descendants of a fragmented heritage and this parting adds to our diaspora when we have only just begun, a revived written tradition, our own narratives rising. This orphan one sought you for so long. What bittersweet papers. Our last meeting is at a small conference, though I don't know that yet. And you read from your second book, the one, the one where you allowed my poem to be printed alongside yours and other home writers. I have three copies, one inscribed for me, one for my family, and one extra just to have. It's a collection of your works, including poems from your first book published in 2002 that is now out of print. You speak with unintentional, un, unintentional vibrato and it's clear your throat often, but I attribute it to the colder weather. I'm an optimist or willfully ignorant your energy is still the same, kind and warm, so I still believe. We stand outside shaded by a gentle shedding tree and two of our writer friends join us. We form a circle, reminisce and verbalize hopes to reunite in the near future. You point to the hearing aid and say it's a current development. We speak a little louder just in case. Then you turn to me and say something important. I know it is, though I can't recall it, your earnest, urgent voice comes through. Sure, I'm so inspired by you who is our literary voice beyond the days of evening blossoms and early sunrises. You tell me to write what's in my heart, sorrows and joys all together, and you believe in me. Grandfather of Mo American literature, Bob Moore, please know that a voice is not raised alone and does not forget. It molds from you, ancestor, your poetics are not lost. I hear them. This voice honors you as you have honored me. Uh, this second piece is a, a bit longer and still being revised, but to give you some more context in my thesis, you know, uh, my dear mentioned a little bit about it already, but there are a lot of wandering, a lot of thinking about the feeling of what it means to be a Hmong American, especially a Hmong American woman, and also thinking about traditions and rituals and what it means to hold on or let go of these things. And this piece particularly is thinking about language. <clears throat> The title is a work in progress. Um, I just called it a Hmong literacy narrative or finding Hmong, but you know, I'll probably fix it in the final one. <clears throat> when you see your sister run out of the house to play with other cousins, tattle to your father. 
show your indignance and decry why you can't do the same. You want to go out and play and not stay with your older sisters who are learning the alphabet from your father. Do not envy her, he says, because you will know more than her and she will regret it. It is the only reason why you stay to listen to one day one up your annoying sister for leaving you behind. Your father's handwriting is not clunky, clunky like your left hand. You don't remember any lessons from that day, already quickly falling asleep on the couch, but you remember the curves and loops and dashes of his letters, reminiscent of Thai and Lao scripts. You don't remember if you joined in more sessions after this day, after it was obvious you were still too young, barely five years old, but you remember enough because you will always be prouder in your ability to discern certain words over your sister. But writing and reading doesn't feel necessary when you know English and all the school official documents and newsletters come in the English language. Occasionally, because you live in an area with a high number of Hmong, the school will send papers with both versions and you attempt to read the Hmong out of, the sheer, out of sheer curiosity, but rarely get past the first paragraph before you puff out and exhale. You know the easy words like go, but the specific jargon like te chu is confusing. You don't hear these in your everyday conversations with your family. You don't know what they mean and can only assume from context or ask your older sisters or your parents. You are lucky that they are literate, but you learn grandmother is not. On her flip phone, your phone number is on speed dial. She doesn't understand the letters on the screen, not even your aunts and uncles names. She was born before the script and had no reason to learn or perhaps didn't have the opportunity. Speaking is all she needs. Even if your brain doesn't process, process her words, you feel it vibrate in your head. Your body knows. Speaking comes in your nature, it is the language of your heart. So then where did the words go? You dream in emotion and moods and you don't know what language you see at night. Your brain gets tired of translating Hmong to English, English to Hmong, Hmong to Hmong, English to English. The connector is lost, the power is gone, your mouth babbles. Sometimes it feels like the word has been grinded through a paper shredder. All you have left are hundreds of strips with unattached syllables. So you never think that your Hmong is good enough, although your mentees and young friends compliment on your good Hmong. You feel undeserving, an imposter, because you know it wasn't that good. Among your friends, you still turn to English so that you are not exposed for what you lack. You don't want to show how deprived you are. Even the most simple lyric lines from nostalgic songs of your childhood are bent on leaving you, and you feel that gripping fear of your tongue lifting, but the air from your lungs don't know which way to turn. The energy of the lyrics can't be found. You haven't been able to hold it, grow it, harness it. From your heart to your mouth, the path, path has turned into a river, and you don't know if you are getting swept away or if the words can't make it across. Your mouth opens and gurgles. You miss that time when you listened to old songs with your mother on the tape player and the singer said something you didn't understand so you simply asked her. She rewinded the tape and listened to it again and then told you how the song was about a husband's lament about an unappreciated wife who will regret it one day when she returned and found his body yellow. You asked about what that meant for how could a body turn yellow? And then she told you that of course it meant that he was dead. And suddenly the song was clear to you and so much more tragic than you could have imagined at the age of eight. But you love that imagery. You love that profoundness. You love sitting next to your mother and looking up to her as she explained line by line that these sounds are connected and make these meanings. You feel so close to her. And so you put your head on her crossed knees and close your eyes, feeling her presence and hearing songs. There was one summer when your older sister took the initiative to teach you and your sisters in her bedroom where there was the most space and the best sunlight. Your three sisters and you crammed onto her queen size bed and endured a couple of days of lecture, squinting at, a, at the small whiteboard, but it was summer. All you wanted to do was nap away the heat or watch TV shows. While your sisters talked, you lied down, pretending to write until you fell asleep. Everyone lost motivation by the end of the week everyone returned to their original routines. You make promises to pick it up the next summer and then the next and so forth until it was forgotten, until carefree summers no longer existed and you work to make money to pay, pill, to pay, excuse me, to pay bills and to pay for vacations. 
Though you know the words are disappearing, you are not noble, so you do not go searching for them. It has become such a laborious task. You don't ask them to come back. You tell them that these roots can't be destroyed, but forget that anything left alone will turn to dust. You ignore them, so they come find you. In Chinese historical dramas, there are characters who call their mother Nia, and it startles you, reminds you that your long ago ancestors came from this part of the world. This one similarity hints to you a history, another connection that you hold on to tightly. A different source of energy ushers forward as you come across their twins and cousins. Suddenly, you have a renewed interest in Chinese dramas, something you used to watch often as a child. Now you come across many words that delight you in their closeness to your own, like the words for one or old. You even pick up, lear you even pick up learning Chinese basics on a language app. So you're elated to find out that the spelling in Chinese makes the same sound as the t consonant in mong. Then there is your last name too. One day you come across a female protagonist who has your last name. You search the character on Google Translate and find that it means bear. And your father once told you that your last name was related to bears. Did he know about this or had it come from a myth passed to him from his elders? And in Thai dramas too, you come across them. You hear the words for guitar, sugar, purse, go. How many more can you discover if you learn this language too? These things are so minuscule, but hold so much importance to you. All these fragments fill you with joy. Your brother thinks that these connections mean that Hmong is a pitiful, deprived language, but you think now it means that there is so much history you don't know. So much has been lost that your current written language is, ex is expressed with a Romanized alphabet. This time, you do search for them. You revisit music and movies. You take a beginning Hmong language class where you are the oldest and only graduate student. You attend a panel where you learn how the musicality of your language is performed in instruments like the leaf. You are no expert. You seek any connection in this world where it, you seek any connection in this world where it is so easy to get lost. You want to hold on to everything that calls. You want to find that your existence has not been erased entirely. From this fraught heritage you've inherited, you want to know that you matter. With your nieces and nephews, you call them by their Hmong names. With your youngest brother, you speak in Hmong when you help him with his homework. Though he mostly speaks English now, your efforts are not wasted. You love the little moments when he suddenly switches to Hmong to explain a situation that had happened at home. It tells you that perhaps Hmong has a place in his heart too. The poetics you find tells you of a beauty you did not know. You think of the word ling, in which it is a former word to address a person, like for your parents, ling nia, ling zi, and it has a trochee meter. You have never noticed these arts in your language, these traditions that hints to you of a complex and rich heritage. You didn't understand before, but now you hear them. Now you even like your given name, the birth one. It has one meaning only, although if pronounced with different tones, it could mean to repay or to know. You used to hate how your name could quickly slip into a different word as if you are some kind of chameleon, but for the first time in a long time, you like that possibility, that you are not composed of only one thing, but many. Your Hmong name, like your language, is alive. It means to change. Bao. Uh, thank you, that's all I have. And I didn't prepare anything for like the end script. So I'm just gonna say again, thank you everyone for being here, for listening to uh, me, to Mariah and being here, just joining us. Yeah, I think I'm just going to end it like that. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>